Hi. They said, I'm Norman Meir, and I'm with Best Incorporated. I uh, am an MIT. I sit through the review uh, for the revisions for E to F. I'm also on the committee for uh, the uh, training material. Training material, the beta edition, is not going to be out until February, so the new course probably won't be out until March or April next year. So I'll go ahead and give you a heads up on that. But you can go ahead and use the latest revision uh, in your companies, because the Rev-E is gone now, but the training still will be to the Rev-E until the Rev-F course material is available. And if you are instructors, uh, you can, when you get the new revision, you just keep on teaching. You don't need to go back to the class. You just keep on going with it. But uh, again, welcome. I'm Norman, and I'm with Best Incorporated. So let's have some fun for the next 45 minutes. And at the end of the PowerPoint presentation, I'll open it up to questions and answers. Okay? So here we go. First thing that we want to look at is uh, what we've done was try to split it up as much as we could. Uh, so you can see that they deleted if a conflict occurs between the English and translated versions of this document. The English version will take precedence. So with the old ones, it was different. So there is a lot of languages out there now, and uh, they've really worked with the, the industries throughout the different countries, and I think they've done a pretty good job on getting the translation. Okay, in the old Rev E, you can see here, uh, this is new, uh, into the Rev F, the personal proficiency, all instructors, operators, and inspection personnel shall be proficient in the task to be performed. Objective evidence of that proficiency shall be maintained and available for review. Objective evidence should include records of training to the applicable job functions being performed, work experience, testing to the requirements of this standard, and or results of periodic reviews of proficiency. Supervised on-the-job training is acceptable until proficiency is demonstrated. This is, if you were to do the J standard, you would actually see this in there. So they've just brought it over into the 610 itself. Here you can see so Rev-E where we deleted and changed it to the different paragraphs. Everybody can hear me, correct? Uh, I can hear somebody in the background. If you put your phone on mute, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, OK, I'll see what I can do. Uh, I don't know why you can't hear. Uh, well, he's probably doing it at this minute. I've got everything unmuted on my end. Uh, uh, can you mute yourself? Some of you are getting your feedback. Like Nancy, I can hear you. There's a lot of feedback going on here. Can you hear me now? We can hear you, Nancy. Okay. So here we're going to go on with it. So if you need to mute your phone. Okay, thank you. So you can see here where the change, we remove level of acceptance and change it to the word conditions. For all three are target acceptable defect process indicator. Then we go into uh, 1.5.6. Leaching has been removed. And you can see we've actually added in the word FOD, Foreign Object Debris. Uh, some of you uh, still need to put your phones on mute, please. Please. Because I am getting a lot of feedback on this end. I can hear a few people still talking. Okay, there we go. So you got foreign object 
object debris, a generic term for substance, debris, particular matter, or article alien to the assembly or system. In other words, it's not normal. You could have dirt, lint, uh, dross. It doesn't matter. It's debris that's on the board that should not be there. Solder balls are spheres of solid remain after the soldering process. It includes small balls of solder paste. They used to also call that, uh, there would be like talking about solder fines, so they just put it as solder balls. Oh. Um, then we jump to paragraph 1.10. It used to say referee conditions are used to verify a product rejected at the inspection power. Now what it says, if a presence of a defect cannot be determined at the inspection power, the item is acceptable. The referee magnification power is intended for use only after a defect has been determined, but it's not completely identifiable at the inspection power. So yes, you've noticed the defect, now you're just verifying that defect of what it is. That's what you're doing with referee. Then you are uh, talking about uh, chapter three, or section three in the book. Uh, it's intended to be in general nature. This is, remember this is a standard book, and Section 3 does not have anything to deal with standards. If you want to know more, you go to ESD 2020. There was a lot of talk during the committee meetings of uh, removing it. Then there was talk about making an appendix only. So this is where they left it at. Left it in there for you all as good information, spec information or standard information. So remember that. Then we've got all these other changes throughout here, Revs E's and to Rev F's. You can see the numbers have changed down through there. 4-1 component, uh, heat sink to 414, used to be 413. So be careful down through there. Now, uh, when this class is over, you will get a red line document. Now, there is some differences between the two, so go through it very slowly so you can see what the actual ones are. It took us a while to do this. Then now we added into paragraph 4151 under acceptability. It says no evidence of damage resulting from tightening of the threaded item. 4151 defects. It says threaded items are not tight and split ring lock washer, if used, is not compressed. See figure 421. Fastener torque value, if specified, is not within the limits. Hardware is loose. Evidence of damage resulting from over tightening of a threaded item. Sometimes if you've got like plastics, uh, you can overdo that. Some of the smaller screws, you can overdo that too, uh, especially if they're torqued. It goes on to tie up fasteners that other thread are. In addition to the third fasteners used for installation of an item onto an assembly, there are other types of threaded items that may be used in individual parts in the assembly. These may require tightening to a specific torque value or standard industry practice to include loosening or part damage. Such items include, but are not limited to, the connector, couple of nuts, connector strain relief, clamps, potting, molding boots, etc. Fuse, holder, mounting nuts, and any other similar threaded items. It also goes uh, further on where torque requirements are not specified following standard industry practice. It says, however, some of these threaded items may be made of plastic or other materials that can be damaged. Again, like I said, if excessive torquing. It says, except Rev F, acceptable for all three. It says here, the thing we added is no evidence of damage resulting from over tightening of the threaded item. Defect, threaded items are not tight and split lock washers, if used, is not compressed. See figure 421. Hardware is loose, evidence of damage resulting from over tightening of the threaded items. So you can see we added some words in there to make it flow a lot easier. Here on the left we deleted wire wrapped around the screw body in the correct direction, but a few threads, strands have unraveled. This is like your, uh, on your bus bars, uh, around outlet stuff that you're going to wrap a screw or a wire around a screw head is what you're looking at. 
So here we got the defect, more than one-third of the wire down protrudes from under the screw head. Wrap more than 360. And a lot of others are just changing the figures up for you. Then uh, restraining device wire bundle securing. That's to keep them nice and tight. It used to just say, like it says up there, restraining devices are neat and tight and spaced to keep. It says now the restraining, restraining devices do not move. Restraining devices do not cause notes or indentations or distortions of the wire or the assembly. Acceptable restraining devices does not have any longitudinal movement but may rotate. In other words, go around in a circle, but they won't move left or right. And this information here that we're seeing, if you ever went to the IPC WAMA Wire Harness Manufacturers Association 620, you would see this information right here what we were just talking about. So now we're talking about some of the soldering anomalies, like 527 is entrapped, encapsulated, attached, fixed meets that normal service environment of the product will not cause particulate matter to become dislodged. The key word there is to make sure it doesn't come dislodged. So we're just talking about solder balls, um, anything that will come loose. Next, it's into 5.2.12, and it says here, hot tears, shrinkage voids are generally found on the surface of solder joints. The connection with the hot tear shrinking voids shall meet all other acceptance criteria. And it says acceptable hot tear shrinkage of voids, it says a crevice or a void in the solder joint due to solidification of the lead-free solder alloys during assembly process. Then we move on to 6112, talking instead of pad gap, like it did in Rev F, we just said land separation. So if they're separate for one and two, we separate that out a little bit more. Terminal base circumference has more than 100 degrees, 180 degrees contact with the land, with separations not exceeding two land thicknesses. Class three, terminal base circumference has more than 270 degrees contact with the land, with separation not exceeding one land thickness. And if you notice, looking on the left-hand side, that used to be all together and to be acceptable for all three classes. Defect is less than 180 degrees contact. Terminal base has separations exceeding two land thicknesses. Defect for class three, terminal base circumference has less than 270 degrees contact with the land. Terminal base has separations exceeding one land thickness. You can see where we deleted solder fillet at least 75% of the flange height. In class three, no radial circumferential slits, 75% flange height. These have been deleted. If you look over here, minimum solder requirements for all three classes now is 75% or more of the land area is covered with wetted solder. Solder fillet at least 75% of the flared flange height. Remember that's uh, not to exceed 120 degrees of angle. Solder filler is 100% of the flat flange height. And that's when they're, like I said, that's like if you do an eyelid or something, you want it flat to the board. Then we jump to 6.2.1.1, talking about insulation damage or pre-solder. We've added to it the cut ends of some insulation materials, particularly those of fiberglass barrier, may show frame. Except both this frame should be agreed upon between the manufacturer and the user. This criteria are also applicable to pot to post assembly acceptance. Additional criteria for damage is in 6212. So we deleted acceptable for class one for 622 is the clearance. Exposed bare wire provided there's no damage or violation of minimum electrical clearance. And then we jump down to 623, flexible sleeve. Remember, this is your heat shrinkable tubing that's going to be your new insulator after you've stripped the wires and or attached them to a terminal post or a, uh, of some type. So this criteria is intended for use for shrink sleeving, criteria for the types so of sleeving should be agreed upon between manufacturer and user. Cleaning, if required, shall be accomplished prior to shrinking of the sleeving. Heating process is used to shrink sleeving insulation shall not damage the connector 
wire, sleeving, adjacent components, nor reflow the solder connection. Uh, there's some really good pictures in the 620 on where they've heated it up and the actual solder is wicked way up into the insulation area. So you've got to be careful of how much heat you are using that you don't damage anything. Uh, we've added into table 6.2, we've deleted allowable and, and changed it to strand damage only. And it's for all three classes. you got the notes 1, 2, and 3. If you look down there, there are some changes to the notes. So it makes it a little easier. We've added for the number of strands one solid conductor. The old revision, it actually indicated and stated that you would refer to a solid conductor. So you do the 10%, just like it's showing there. So they actually brought it over and, and installed it. Then we go to 6322, and it breaks down that a little bit. From there, you go here and you know you go through all your little pictures. So what you're doing basically is tape in six, table 62 and the one solid conductor across there, and you're making it 6322 also. It says no nicks or deformations exceeding 10% of the diameter width or thickness of the conductor. See paragraph 521 for exposed base metal criteria. Defect, it is more than 10% of the diameter width or thickness. Wire deformed from repeated bending. I always say that's like a hind crooked leg of a dog. It's deformed. People keep repeating bending and bending it over and over again. Should be a one shot, one, de one kill deal. Then we're going into the table of uh, what you're seeing is 30 gauge wire and smaller. Table 16 is applicable to 30 gauge. They actually added the table into here. So you can see when it's less than 9 degrees, it's a defect for all three. 90 to 180, acceptable defect for 2 and 3. 180 to 360, acceptable for 1, process for 2, defect for 3, greater than or equal to 360 degrees, acceptable. In other words, we broke this, we put it into a table, and then you break it down. We, uh, in 615, 616, we deleted the words terminals. We just said uh, serious connect because you know when you're in this section you're dealing with wires and terminals. Then acceptable, we deleted a lot of information that you can see on the left hand side. Unsleeved horizontally mounted components, unsleeved vertically mounted sleeve axial glass body the adhesives. We're looking at the uh, adhesive section. So uh, this is going on with it now. They've relocated it. Continuous adhesive filler to the mounting surface and component body. Adhesive is cured. No gap separation cracks between the staking and attached surfaces. No horizontally mounted components of staking material. Adheres to the component for at least 50% of its length. The ball buildup of the staking material does not exceed 50% of the diameter. Minimum 25% component diameter. D on one side. And this, if you want to know where I'm at, I'm on 7221. And then it just keeps on going. You got more information there on page 726. So it's on vertically mounted components, the staking material bead as continuous for at least 25% of the component length, the site flow of the staking material under the component body. The staking material adheres to the component for at least three beads, spaced approximately evenly around the circumference, or for a minimum of at least 50% of the component circumference. Glass body components are sleeved when required prior to staking material attachments. Adhesive staking bind does not contact an unsleeved or glass body component. Sleeved glass body components has staking material applied to both sides of the component from 50 to 100% of its length and 25% of its height. Multiple vertically mounted components, staking material adheres to each component for at least 50% of its length, and adhesion is continuous between the two components. Remember, vertically mounted is standing straight up and down. Okay, so staking material adheres to each component, 50, and staking material adheres to each component for at least 25% of its circumference, in other words, going around it. Then on the next page, 727, you've got not established one, process two, defect for three. 
The two items there originally have been deleted and been and what we've added to it or changed, it says here for horizontally mounted component stick material in excess of fifty percent of the diameter, provided the top of the component is visible. For sleeve glass body component stick materials applied to both sides of the component, minimum fifty percent of the component's length. Then you've got not established for one, but a defect for two and three, which used to be a process indicator for class one. So sleeved actually axial leaded components except, except glass body components does not have staking material in contact with both of the end faces of the component. Adhesive is less than 25% of the component diameter. Adhesive is greater than 50% of its diameter. Top of the component body is not visible. Sleeve component does not have staking material for minimum 25%. And then everything I just talked about, you look on the next page, 728, makes it a defect for all three classes. Then we jump to 733, found on page 735. And yeah, it looks a little blurry because we removed it uh, from the uh, red line document and just put it in here. So lead protrusion should not allow a possibility of violating minimal electrical spacing. We've deleted all that. It just says now lead protrusion shall be in accordance with table 7.3. And then you can look down here in note 1, remove manufacturer. Note 2, we remove the .050 and change it to .05 inch. So you can see it a lot easier because there was some confusion. And then added note number 3 as an exception to the discernible minimum lead length C7.3.5, and we're talking about the paragraph. Now we're moving on to table 7.4, which is several pages over, you're looking at page 740. And what they changed there was the vertical fill requirements. Used to state in the old one for class 2 that if you had a ground plane or a thermal mass, that uh, the hole fill only had to be 50%. Now we've changed it for less than 14 leads. And then we've got with leads are 14 or more. So less than or greater than is what you're looking at. And this area right now, what we're talking about, uh, they went into committee again to talk about it. So they're waiting for the beta courses to be completed. There might be an addendum to this section uh, they haven't officially said what they're going to do, so we're still in discussion about that. Sorry. Then you can see where we did in 7351, where we actually put the, what the table showed, we actually put it into writing, what is acceptable for class one, what is a defect for class, or a defect for class two, what is a defect for class three. Vertical fill was less than 75%. And then not accepted for one, approximate due defect for three, that was actually removed completely. That used to be in the old revision. Now we're jumping to 753. Just turn a few pages, well, not a few, quite a few over. 753, where we're talking about jumper wires. Says acceptable for all three. Is uh, the, the second bullet, or the first bullet there. Talking about the jumper, the wires not soliciting and extend above the height. Except one defect for two, the wires loosen can extend above the top. So we deleted the two items there. Then you jump to 756, and you're going to be looking at the previous page, 755. We actually added a little statement in there at the bottom of that one bullet for uh, jump wires 30 gauge and smaller do not comply with clause 614.1. And that's at the top of the page on 755, page 772. Then in 756, we deleted jump wires attached to components other than actually component leaded. Lap saw the wires of the component lead. And we've added the following criteria apply when soldering to a land or component lead and land. When soldering to a land, the available contact area is defined as the land diameter. 
I'm sorry, to component lead in land, the variable contact is the distance from the edge of the component land to the knee. So acceptable solder connection that extends a minimum of three. And we're looking at that page right down there on 773, still in 756. We deleted the information from the rev. We've added this. Solder connection extends a minimum of three wire diameters when the available contact area is at least three wire diameters. Acceptable for all one and two, solder connection is 100% of the land or the land lead. The available contact area is less than three wire diameters. Acceptable for three, solder connection is 100% of the land or the land. The available contact area is less than three wire diameters in the stake or otherwise mechanically secured. And see what we've done here was added the stake or otherwise mechanically secured to class three. Defect doesn't meet the requirements we just stated. Defect for all three. Wires that is lap soldered is less than 75% from the edge of the land to the knee. Wire extends beyond the knee of the component lead. Remember, again, if it's an RF circuit that uh, and somebody's doing stuff, you can actually pull that back off of there or cause an RF issue. Lead violates minimum electrical clearance. Now we get into Section 8. Uh, that was a, a lot of different arrangements, moving words, so hopefully it will work better. So this section covers acceptability requirements. We removed all of that. Dimension G. And what I put in there is in 912, or 812, I'm sorry, was uh, the targeted was removed. It says this criteria is for adhesive added after component attachment. The circumference of bonding may have one or more adhesive points. Then acceptable. We had on round component adhesives adhere to a minimum of 25% of the component height. On round components, a minimum of three bands of staking material, material placed approximately evenly around the periphery of the component. Rectangular components are staked at each corner, a minimum of 25% of the height. And then down staking does not interfere with stress relief. Slight flow under the component body does not damage the component or affects form, fit, or function. Now, what sometimes happens when this adhesive cures, it, it can expand and actually crack your solder joints. So be careful with that. 812 not established for class one. We're looking on page 85. It says round components where adhesive adheres to less than 25% of the component height. On round components, there are less than three beads of stake material. Rectangular components are not staked at each corner. Defect, no evidence of adhesion. The adhesive interferes the formation required the solder connection. Adhesive is not completely cured and homogenous. Adhesive interferes with stress relief. Then 921, you saw a lot of this stuff where it says plastic components it used to be throughout areas, so now they've actually put it right here in the front. Unless otherwise specified, SARS shall not touch a package, body, or in seal. Exceptions are when a copper leader termination configuration causes solder filter to contact a plastic body. Plastic SOIC family, spacing from the top of the lead of the plastic is 0.15. Connectors provide solder does not go into the cavity. Leaders components where the design land extends past the component termination area. When agreed between manufacturer and user. And again, these used to be throughout. Especially like when we were with the gullwing leads, it used to be the exception. Or years ago, rev C and D used to be high profile, low profile. Then they went into with the rev E, and they kept it with, and they moved it into rev F. Is the SOIC and SOT, as long as it's a plastic body, solder can touch the package body. It is acceptable. Then the uh, SMT connections are providing 831 through 8315. Talks about dimension G in here now. So they moved it from the very beginning of this, where it used to be right on the beginning of 8 1, they actually give it its own little location. So SMT connections target no evidence of tilted or raised component. 
acceptable component tilted raised does not violate minimal electrical clearance or exceeds maximum component height requirements or affect form fitter function. If it doesn't meet these requirements, it is a defect. And you can see that down below. And that is all found on page 8.8. Then we get into the tables. This is table 8.2, so you've got to go several pages over. We're talking about one, three, and five-sided components on page 8-15. You can see they removed the note in uh, minimum fillet height. Remember that used to be the via holes? And then we, uh, if you look, go down to minimum in overlap. All that said, used to say it was required for all three classes. Now we've actually said that, you know, is for class three, R, which is, if you look down, termination link, they've added that too, tells you that is on your component body. That is its length, okay? And they can vary in size. So it's 25% of R has to overlap the pad. They removed note seven and eight, now it's six and seven. So if you read note number eight on the down there, it says component size may be larger than 1206 if the component is less than a 1.25 to one with the height ratio and has five terminations. So now what we did from the table, you go to 8328, which is several pages over, but the board already shows it, so it meets acceptability or it doesn't. It's a defect for class three. Then eight, three, two, nine, one. Talking about the component sizes now, which was in that note, note number eight. Okay. Talking, still talking about billboarding, acceptable for class three. Then you get your defects were deleted, it's just defects for class one and two now instead of all three, because class three has a lot more. With the height ratio, does not exceed two to one. Incomplete wedding of at least three terminations, less than 100% overlap, component overhangs the land, component has less three than termination sides. Again, it goes on incomplete wedding of at least three component terminations. This is your billboarding. Then it jumps into flat gull wing leads. So flip over there, the flat gull wing leads. We're going to look at the table right there, a little bit of it. We're talking about maximum toe overhang. There was a lot of questions, and if you look down at the minimum side joint length, when that was and that was in the last revisions. It says when L is less than 3W, it has to be 100% of L. Now, if the toe overhangs the edge of the pad, you cannot get a full wedding, the full length of L. So they actually added that, not permitted when L is less than 3W. So then it cannot hang over the edge of the pad. Note number four change, solder does not test the package body or in seal, but refer back to 8.21. If it's of the SOIC family or SOT, uh, then it is acceptable as long as it's a plastic body. Now we're looking at 8382, talking about the butt or eye connections. They've added some information to that. And this is what they solder charge terminations. Um, these are like on some of your uh, Simtech connectors that they have. Uh, if you look at the picture on 878, figure 8139, you'll actually get a good view of that. And then some of the next few pages, like 8141, 8142, and that's filled with solder there, and then it goes into reflow. Okay, so maximum side overhang, not permitted. Tell overhang, not permitted. Minimum end joint width, across there, it has to be 100%. Minimum fillet height completely fills bottom hole on the termination. Some of these have two holes in them, so you don't have to worry about the top one. And lead width is note one. Land width, note one, unspecified. So there's a good picture of what they look like. I said, 
Uh, figure 139, 141, and 142 are some really good pictures of it. They show the side view on figure 8, 141, 44, I'm sorry. So this is a new style of connector or, that they've been using. Then 8391, flat lug leads, flat uniform leads, flat uniform flexible circuit determinations. Uh, they put that in there. You see down at the very bottom on page 885, not at the very bottom, but at the end of the table. Maximum side overhang, 50%, note one, 25% for two, and just 25% for class three. Then your maximum gap, it's talking about M sometimes. Remember that uh, there is no gap M. And then jump to table 813. Ball grid arrays. If you notice that they deleted the word spacing and said clearance. They deleted the word offset. Solder ball does not violate minimal electrical clearance. Offset is, is something that's intentionally done. This is something that just happens. It could be uh, you offset it and when it reflowed, or when it reflowed, it overhangs the edge of the pads too. So that's why they had to remove the word offset. And then they changed the voids from 25% to 30% voiding, and see notes one, two, and three on that. And then look down at the bottom, it talks about ball grid array components with non-collapsible balls. It says voids are not acceptable, period. And looking on uh, column grid arrays, solder connection, it used to say external columns show complete wetting or filleting. Now it says all that has to go around is 270 degrees to be acceptable for all three classes. And when required, underfill is presently completely and cured. Now we go to table 817. This is your bottom thermal plane termination. This was your uh, DPAC. So they give you some change some things out. There used to be only a couple things for the thermal plane area. Now they've added a lot more. Thermal plane side joint link D, note one. Then you got thermal plane termination width, note two. Thermal plane land width, note number three, which is unspecified. But note two says solder wetting is not required on trimmed edges of the thermal plane that expose non-wettable vertical surfaces. And criteria for the type of lead. So we've changed that up again. So you can see this is something new. And I have never seen one before, never used one before, but this is a P-style connection. It's like an edge connection. So you've got your board, and this fits on the outside on both sides. And then it is surface mount soldered. So it goes through your ovens. So it clips in. So it's like an edge clip connection. Says here, this is all new. The criteria is applicable to both the toe and heel requirements of the connection. So if you look at 8120, you can see the toe and the heel on the sides area of that letter P that comes down. That's what we're looking at. So target fillet height is 100% of the termination height. Acceptable wetting is evident, except for two and three is 25%. Except for one defect for two and three, it is less than 25%. And then we jump to 10.2.1. So there wasn't a lot of change in section nine. So we go to 10.2.1, found on page 10.5. It says, it talks about crazing. It says see 10.2.5 for edge crazing criteria. Acceptable for two and three. And we're looking at 10-6 page. Crazing at the edge of board does not reduce minimum defined distance between board edge and the conductive patterns. Minimum distance is not specified, not more than 50% or 2.5 millimeters, whichever is less. Um, what they did, uh, again, is that when you're looking at some of these, you're not just looking at the 610. You've got to look at the 600 and the 6012 and see what their criteria is also. 
and bring it over into this and make sure it all flows, that there's no conflict between different standards. And then you've got your defect, crazing areas and land substrate exceeds 50% of the space between non-common conductors. Most otherwise defined, crazing at the edge of the board reduces the distance between board edge conductive patterns more than 50% or 2.5, whichever is less. Defect spacing is reduced below minimum electrical clearance. So for the top part, class one says still ship it. 10.22, blister, class one. Uh, used to be all there, now it's defined out. Uh, the blister delamination spans more than 25%. But if you look at two and three, the blistering delamination does not span more than 25%. So they separated that out a little bit more. Acceptable for all three is the distance between the haloing and penetration and there's conductive pattern. So you're looking at haloing. And that's found on 1010. It's not less than the minimum lateral conductor spacing or 0.1 millimeters of servers less. Defect, 1011. The distance between haloing and penetration is conductive is less than the minimum. Then we go on to your conductor land width. Nixon edge delamination. And this is all found on page 1018. If we were to flip over there, conductor and land reduction. They've deleted some of the minimums. It says reduction in the width of the printer board by more than 30%. Reduction in width or length so on and so forth. So they deleted some of the words out. And in 1032, we deleted, except as noted, this criteria is for lifted pads with or without a lead and a via hole. And then go to 1084, which is quite a few pages over. And it talks about uh, electrical insulation coatings. Uh, so they added this, this material is used to provide insulation to exposed conductor when conformal coating is insufficient. To provide enough protection and encapsulation is too much. All of the considerations used for conformal coatings are applicable for insulating coatings except surfaces coatings applied. This was all revamped, even in the J standard. Uh, insulation coating thickness, complete coverage, no exposed metal. Defect exposed metal. So this is some of the, the main changes. There wasn't hardly anything in Section 11 either, any changes whatsoever. Um, I hope you enjoyed this. Again, my name is Norm Mir. If you have any questions, you can email me at solder.net, nmir at solder.net. Uh, we are taking any questions at this time if you have any. If uh, you will be receiving the copy of the red line document, also an unabridged version of this webinar. There's over 190 slides, and I reduced it down to approximately 70 to get this all in here within 45 minutes to, to an hour. Um, if you have additional information, you can call and contact Katie Radcliffe. Her phone number is on the screen right now, along with her email address. So is there any questions at this time? Well, I hope you enjoyed it. Again, my name is Norman Mir, and I'm an IPC A610 MIT working for Best Incorporated. Uh, I've enjoyed this, and have a nice day. Thank you again. Bye.